Is there an electric universe model of time? I would say not yet. Whenever I spoke with Wolf Thornhill about this, he was very clear that he subscribed to what I would call a simplified Newtonian model of time. I disagree with that, and I feel strongly that classical physics, the physics of gas behavior and quantum mechanics, have a lot to tell us about the nature of time and how time is complex and multidimensional. And just as Emanuel Velikovsky, Dave Talbot, Duardo Cardona and others taught us to take seriously the so-called myths of previous ages, we can look to the knowledge about time possessed by previous ages, dust off our foggy notions of what these supposedly ignorant people were saying, and hopefully get physics back on track. Newton made a distinction between absolute time and apparent time. The quote, awkward as it is, reads, Absolute, true, and mathematical time, of itself and from its own nature, flows equably without relation to anything external, and by another name is called duration. Relative, apparent, and common time is some sensible and external measure of duration by means of motion, which is commonly used, instead of true time, such as an hour, a day, a month, a year. For Newton, absolute time is not measurable. It's not accessible to the senses or instruments. Apparent time is what our senses and instruments show us. Newton's entire system is built upon absolute time, no physical object is capable of measuring absolute time, since everything has natural fluctuations. For example, the amount of daylight varies each day, and two clocks will never exactly agree about when an hour has passed. When we follow in Newton's footsteps and we write the velocity of a falling object, we say it increases proportional to the time and the acceleration. We have an equation like this we see the variable t, and must remember that this refers to absolute time, which exists in a realm we can think about, but we cannot measure. The Newtonian laws of physics exist in a realm that is super sensible and is very real. In the velocity formula, the letter a is the acceleration, the v0 is the velocity when we started our clock. Where is the present moment in all this? You might say the present moment is however many seconds have passed after starting the clock. Yes, but the equation does not know that. Well, you might say, what does it matter? I am living in the present, so I just look at my clock and I see how many seconds have passed. Yes, but the equation does not know that either. The Newtonian laws we are using do not know anything about what we call a present moment. The laws know nothing about a preferred moment of time that I experience as the present moment. The formula gives us a relationship for all times and does not point to any special moment of time. This is a very big deal. What we call the present moment is one of the most obvious aspects of our daily experience. How could it be that the laws of mechanics do not know about this? A second idea is the flow of time. In the Newtonian model, absolute time flows equably. This clearly contradicts our personal experience where in some circumstances time flows very quickly and in other circumstances flows very slowly. Newton would call this our experience of apparent time. The laws of physics, however, say nothing about how quickly time flows. This is related to the absence of a present moment. If physics says nothing about a present moment, then it also can say nothing about how quickly that present moment passes. Our usual perception of the flow of time is directly tied to our metabolism and the design of our nervous system. A mouse appears to me to be moving very fast, breathing very fast. Their life is over very quickly. But the mouse itself does not experience its life that way. To the mouse, the rate of the flow of time is just normal, and its life does not feel short. 
It looks at us and it wonders how strange it would be to be human and lumber about so slowly. You might object that we should not be talking about subjective biological experiences of the flow of time, that we should stick to the physics, which has a variable called T, which Newton says is flowing independent of anything else. Okay, but you, I, and the mouse cannot experience the rate of the flow of absolute time, since absolute time is not accessible to the senses or instruments, and the equations themselves say nothing about any rate of flow of time. So I guess I'm challenging the physicists in the audience to ponder. What do the equations say about time? And how much might I be mixing the physics with my personal and biological notions? I accept both my personal perceptions and the rigor of the equations. For example, I and many other people have had experiences where time flows at a radically different rate. For example, in times of physical danger, like a car accident, time actually slows down. My experience of time jumps to a radically different speed, and hundreds of details that would usually pass unnoticed in a flash are now seen in complete detail, like a movie running in very slow motion. This is not my usual sense of time, but does that make it untrue? My experience is that time can flow at different rates, and the equations of Newtonian mechanics say nothing about there being any one inherently true rate of flow. So like I said, I say both points of view are true. Let us put on the board a bullet summary of the aspects of time we have gleaned from classical physics. One, the reality of a present moment is on shaky ground. Two, the rate at which time flows is unclear. After Newton in the 1700s, another dimension, literally, was added to time through what is called the principle of least action. In layman's terms, if something needs to get from point A to point B, it will always do so in a way that involves the least work. Sounds almost trivial, but it leads to very good physics, both theory and practice. Strange thing is, the principle assumes that there are many possible ways to get from A to B, and the system somehow knows about all those possible paths and somehow ends up finding the easiest way. A perfect example is water flowing down a forest hillside. The water will always find the path such that the entire line is the easiest. How does the water know? You might object that the water knows nothing, that it is following simple cause and effect, and I am reading too much into the equations. But I am starting from a profound respect for the equations. When the equations of physics stand the test of time and solve literally billions of complex problems, I say take them seriously and ponder and be willing to put aside some previously held beliefs. In the principle of least action, we are forced to look at the entire path, the entire duration. We are asked to look at a line of time. Once again, there's no preferred moment, but in a sense, there are no moments. There's a line. We have jumped above the zero dimension of a point into the first dimension of a line. No number of points can make a line. The principle says we must look at lines of time and that the entire line of time is a single object. It is not required to break it up into points. How much used is this principle, you might ask? Well, the principle is applied in mechanics, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, relativity, astrophysics, quantum mechanics, particle physics, and string theory. So yeah, it's got some street cred. Updating our bullet summary of the aspects of time we have gleaned from classical physics, we can add, number three, that there are lines of time as well as points of time. If these are true and I call myself a physicist, then I have some deep pondering to do. Physicists can be a snooty group, tending to believe that they have a bead on the truth, while the masses bumble about in a vague comprehension of things. But if lines of time are real, 
then why do I persist in believing that the past is gone and the future has not yet come to be? My eyes and ears only show me a point in time. If I believe only my senses, then after each moment, where does the whole universe go? Do you really think that all matter in the whole universe just disappears when the clock ticks forward? If so, then you must also believe the entire universe is somehow brought into being with each present moment. Where does this new universe come from? I'm only asking these questions to highlight some weaknesses of thought that plague us when we believe only our senses. What then are my thoughts on an electric universe perspective on time? I cannot put it into one sentence. Everything I've said so far is part of the picture I'm proposing, and we're not done yet. In the 19th century, when Gibbs and others were working out the mathematics to describe the observed behavior of gases, something quite strange needed to be introduced. To even describe something as simple as the air in this room, we needed to assume that we are experiencing multiple possible collections of the air in this room. We could not describe gases as simple deterministic systems. This is so strange that it's worth repeating. In physics, we must describe the air in this room as the collection of all possible different collections of air in this room. Of course, our natural mind objects and says that we all know that there is simply the molecules in the room, and each gas molecule is at one point at any one time and has a certain velocity. This is exactly what we cannot know. It is impossible to even conceive how we would observe that. We were brought up against this idea of relationship or scale. Humans are very large. Gas molecules are very small. The two cannot directly perceive each other. The statistical laws of gases are not saying that the air in the room experiences itself this way. The math is saying that we humans stand in relation to the gas in this strange way. And once again, since the equations have stood the test of time, I'm willing to take them at face value. There is no flow of time. There is no present moment. And there appear to be multiple possible times. And these multiple possible versions of the air in the room all exist at the same time. All these are the attributes of yet another dimension or aspect of time. We can add a fourth to our bullet list that multiple versions of a system can simultaneously exist. Turning now to ancient knowledge, do we find anything like this bullet list? The ideas I am presenting throughout this talk are not my own. Though I have worked very hard to understand and experience what I am saying, I have been very lucky to have teachers and traditions that have helped me understand ideas of time that are not taught in academic science. Our first stop in ancient knowledge is the Hermetica. The Hermetica is a collection of writings from various historical periods, though most of the ideas have their origin in ancient Egypt. And by ancient, I mean tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago. Here is a section pertinent to time from Book 11. God, eon, cosmos, time, becoming. God maketh eon, eon maketh cosmos. Cosmos maketh time, and time maketh becoming. The good is the essence of God. The essence of eon is sameness. Of cosmos, order. Of time, chance. And of becoming, life and death. Notice the levels laid out in this passage. This is a cosmology of worlds within worlds. What we ordinarily call time is only the very last stage, here called becoming. This corresponds to what physics calls the present moment, the T in Newton's equations, which moves along. And in that movement, we see events and objects come into existence and then disappear. Above becoming, is time. 
a perhaps poorly chosen word by the translator from the Greek term that refers more to the line of time that we saw in the principle of least action. The Hermetica says that time has at least two dimensions, or two levels, the lower contained in the higher, just as a point is contained in a line. The lowest dimension of time moves along, like what our senses show us. Above this is time itself, the line of time containing all moments of time. Above this, containing both the line of time and the point of time, is the cosmos, which is a larger, more inclusive level. The cosmos can contain multiple possible lines of time, or all possible lines of time that can exist within the laws that order that cosmos. For now, you do not need to make all the correspondences between the Hermetica and what I said about physics. For now, it is sufficient to acknowledge that here is an ancient civilization speaking very clearly about time having distinct levels or dimensions. As I argued earlier, I'm suggesting that our physics also shows this. We just need someone to explain it to us. But how do we apply this to physics? Do we still use integrals and derivatives? Do we still have a variable called t? I will address this at the end. Let us look at one more ancient teaching about time. We go back 2,000 years to a formulation that is preserved in the pre-Vatican II Catholic liturgy. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in omnia saecula saeculorum. The second line could be translated as, as it is in principle, outside of time, as it is now, in this moment, as it is in the perpetual living existence of all now moments, and as it is in the eon of all eons, or the world of all worlds. No one knows when this phrase was first used. It probably also came from Egypt and was re-expressed by Christ and or his nearest students. It appears clearly in texts in the 4th century. Here again we see that time has levels or dimensions. The term in principio does not mean in the beginning, as it is so often translated, because this implies a sequence in time. In principio is outside of time. How can a creative force be outside of time? Well, perhaps a truly creative force can only be outside of time. The term nunc is the present moment, what our senses show us. The term semper is difficult to translate for us moderns. We would use the word eternity or forever and ever, but these are wrong because they imply a very long duration of time or an infinite line of time. But that was not the meaning in 30 AD. Eternity is a dimension of time where moments always exist and are always present and are always alive. Plato says that time is a moving image of eternity. It is kind of set backwards to say that eternity is made up of moments, and we should instead think of eternity as already existing, and any line of time we experience sensually is a particular slice or shadow through eternity. Eternity itself is alive and can be redeemed, as in the phrase describing the making of a new and eternal covenant. All this, of course, is difficult for our sense-based minds to comprehend. If you look for a modern translation of the term secula seculorum, you will find often world without end. This translation is poor, and maybe even intentionally poor, maybe even harmful. Secula more properly translated, is an age or an eon. An age is something like the age of the dinosaurs. An age is something like the first 2,000 years of Chinese civilization. According to Egyptian schools, for us humans, an age 
is roughly the 2,000 years it takes for the sun to pass through one zodiac sign. And a great age is the full 25,000 years of the full cycle of our sun around its parent, Sirius. An age, or an eon, is a completed span of time that has its own organic unity and includes the birth, life, and death of everything within it. There could be ages on a small scale, such as all the cells you had while you were in the womb. There can be ages on a very large scale, such as all the lives of all the stars that have ever lived in a galaxy. Then, Secula Seculorum is the eon of eons, or the age that is made up of all possible ages. This is dimensions of time built up from other dimensions of time. Again, it may be better to say that first, the eon of all eons exists, and from this are sliced out particular eons. Before the Catholic Church amply earned its horrific reputation, as the destroyer of Christ-like values, it was actually quite concerned with passing along the newly revealed ideas. Powerful ideas were released upon humanity around 30 AD. Up until the 4th century, students would travel long distances once a year at Easter to receive weeks of instruction about the many new ideas that came from Palestine. The phrase I quoted above was a whole course of study in the Easter semester for Christians in the first four centuries of this era. My point being that the early church knew very well that time had dimensions, and we needed to study this in order to receive new meanings about ourselves and the universe. The multidimensionality of time was taught in most previous civilizations. I'm certain that you could dive into material of any older civilization and find ideas about the dimensions or levels of time. Does any of this translate into a new physics? Contemporary physics is stuck for several reasons. One of those reasons is that our concept of time has become too flattened, too simplified, made childish and cartoonish. I've tried to show that the physics we already use actually uses multidimensional time. So maybe we do not need a new physics. We only need to be shown what our physics is already saying. But as scientists, what do we want from new ideas of time? We already have a physics that lets us build fancy technologies. Do we want new technologies from new ideas of time? If so, what do we want this tech to do for us? If the military-industrial complex got a hold of a time machine, that certainly would not end well. A new physics built upon dimensions of time is not going to be divorced from human consciousness. The mystery of the role of the observer in quantum mechanics is just the tip of the iceberg. As an introduction to such physics, Try experimenting with some of the ideas of time presented here. Much misery and suffering comes from our limited experience of time. When my only experience of myself is jammed into a point of no dimensions, this gives me a limited perception of who and what I am and who and what other people are. When my awareness is only attached to a point that is rushing inexorably forward, when the past disappears and the future never exists, all this causes frantic anxiety and an inability to understand cause and effect. Our personal experience of time can be rich and multidimensional. The ideas I presented here are ones that I have been given and have been working with for years and are here presented very quickly, perhaps too quickly. With a new experience of time comes a different set of emotions and perceptions. Previous civilizations taught the dimensionality of time in part because we humans will always be stuck in an almost animal existence unless we can radically change our understanding of ourselves and our possibilities. So is there an electric universe perspective on time? You have heard my arguments from classical physics and older civilizations. 
My goal actually is not to convince you that time has dimensions. My goal is to convince you that our ancestors thought so. And if you believe an ancient Japanese text which says that a new planet, Venus, entered our solar system, perhaps you will believe an Egyptian text that says that time has three dimensions, just as space does. As the species with amnesia, we have also forgotten our noble origins, a nobility so high that we were once considered worthy to be taught about eternity and all possibilities.